Welcome to our second Friday Innovation Forum, whose subject this year is Idea to Impact. I'm so glad we have such a good turnout for today. Um, let me just introduce our speakers to you here, and then um, I'll turn the pro program over to Ted, and he'll, he'll start the conversation. But um, first, we have uh, Ted, who's the furthest over that away, which is my left, you'd be your right. And he's the um, Associate Vice Chancellor for um, Innovation and Economic Development here at ECU. In that realm, Ted's in charge of basically three broad components here on the campus. Uh, community enhancement and regional development is one. <clears throat> Cluster-based economic development, another. Innovation and entrepreneurship and small business is the third cluster. Now, you may have heard of some of the offices that report to TED, um, but you might not have known how they all fit together. Um, under these clusters, we have the Small Business Technology Development Center, the SBTDC. We have the Entrepreneurial Initiative, the Innovation Design Lab, which Wayne is here to represent today, the Office of Technology Transfer, which is where I come from. There's also the Survey Research Lab, the Office of Community and Regional Development, Operation Reentry, North Carolina, which is our link with the military, and we have Jim Menke representing that group here, and also Industry and Economic Development. Ted's been here since 2007. Prior to that, he came here from um, NC State, where he was a, a Chief Economic of Development Officer there, and before that, he worked in the venture capital arena in the Research Triangle where he funded businesses that spun out of university research. Um, Ted has um, all of his degrees, uh, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate in forestry. Next, in, in the middle, we have Sharon Rogers, who's our associate uh, professor of health, and, um, health education and promotion. If I had to describe Sharon, she kind of covers a wide range. Certainly, she's an educator. She's a seasoned researcher. She's an author. I told you she's an inventor. She's an athletic trainer. And she's a trainer's trainer. And she takes all of these things very seriously. If I had to note some qualities from Sharon, I would say that she's persistent. She's tenacious. She's committed. And she is passionate. And there's nobody more passionate about student athletes here in Pitt, Pitt County in eastern North Carolina than Sharon. And it's this passion that she has that has allowed her to become the researcher that she is and the inventor that she ha is and working towards development of a product and business based on all of these things. So we're very fortunate to have Sharon here with us. Um, Sharon has her bachelor's degree in kinesiology from the College of William and Mary. She has a master's in exercise science with a certificate in gerontology. And she has a PhD in human development for Virginia Tech. She did her postdoctoral studies at Duke University. She's a board certified athletic trainer licensed in North Carolina and Virginia. And she served in the um, athletic training community throughout eastern North Carolina Virginia, South Carolina, and has even volunteered as a um, athletic trainer with the U U.S. Olympic team. I got very excited when I learned that. <laughs> she arrived here in 2007, and um, let me see, among many of her accomplishments, she uh, was the focus of a documentary um, by CNN's Dr. Sanjay Gupta entitled Big Hits, Broken Dreams. She's supported by um, sponsored programs work from Pitt County Schools and Pitt Community College, and she also received a pilot program accelerator award to promote her invention that she's um, done here. She's a graduate of the ECU Engagement Outreach Scholars Academy. She's uh, served as a mentor to new EOSA scholars and a mentor to students. EOSA scholars. So we're very glad to have Sharon with us here today. And last but not least, we have Wayne Godwin, Associate Professor of Animation and Interactive Design and Director of ECU's Innovation Design Lab. The Innovation Design Lab is a technology-based environment 
that uses design to connect academic disciplines and industries for development of new products, processes, and even policies. Wayne works with local industry to develop traditional and advanced learning technology programs that teach innovation and design thinking. Under Wayne's direction, the um, university received the uh, University Economic Development Association Award given for top three programs in the nation for excellence in a community connected campus. Also, the ECU Middle School Inventors Innovators Academy was recognized as a top ranked program nationally by the UEDA as well for excellence and talent development. Um, I was thrilled to learn just the other day that under um, Wayne's direction, over 200 students have gone through the Innovation Design Academy here at ECU, ranging in age from fourth grade to departing military from our local bases. So Wayne's going to tell you a bit more about that um, in his innovation talk. So with that, thank you again for being here today. And let me turn the program over to Ted, who's going to serve as our facilitator. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Marnie. And welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your Friday to join us. We greatly appreciate it. Um, it it's my particular pleasure uh, to be here with, uh, with Wayne and Sharon. Um, we do a lot of, of work with uh, some very special communities, as uh, Marty indicated, and one thing we know from, from all of our work is really nobody accomplishes anything special in this world without a lot of routine support. Uh, and in that regard, Wayne has done a tremendous amount, uh, as you will learn, to, uh, to create an environment and an infrastructure and an ecosystem uh, that allows many folks uh, to do some special things with the, with the unique support provided. Uh, similarly, uh, I'm thrilled to be here with Sharon. I've, I've had the blessing to watch many of her accomplishments over the years and, and uh, interact with her. She went through the uh, Engagement and Outreach Scholars Academy, and the reality is she is one of our special operators amongst the faculty, um, both in, in passion and performance and, and impact. So, greetings to both of you. We appreciate it very much. Um, this is, as Marty indicated, the second in a series. Uh, we had some take-home messages uh, at our last meeting that uh, are worth revisiting a, a bit in a nutshell. They were uh, uh, certainly uh, from, from Mike and uh, Sam Sears, the recommendation to you know, always, always keep others in mind, uh, seek to get to that point of yes in any situation, uh, and, and find that way to channel your passion and, and be open. Uh, today, we'll start you off with our take-home messages for today as well. Um, one, I think we would all agree, problems and opportunities are everywhere. Um, I've got them written down, I've done my glasses on. Uh, focus on solutions, exercising flexibility, certainly a key, as you all will discuss, uh, and demonstrate your passion. I, I would boil that down e even to some simpler things. Um, there is, without a doubt, as many of you know in our region, opportunity everywhere uh, to make a difference to solve problems, to have an impact, and to benefit uh, those around the region and, and ourselves at the same time. Uh, we have a saying in, in our office as that uh, Marty sort of described the boundaries of to you, get off the porch. At the end of the day, you can't help but trip over those opportunities if you get off the porch uh, and go out and, uh, and, and visit the region uh, and see where you might connect. The other is Semper Gumby. Uh, you will find that in this line of work, being always flexible, uh, as Mike and Sam highlighted at our last session, uh, is certainly a requirement. Uh, and if you, can, uh, if you can adopt that mantra, you'll find that that, uh, I think, enhances opportunities and how you can execute on those. Really today, I think, could, could be described to be also about execution. Uh, Marty said it very well at the beginning. We, we are interested in and seek to be supportive of you across a very wide spectrum. Some, some people may think of invention. Some people may think of innovation, but whether you simply want to grow your own consulting practice or you're looking to form a startup or you have something that's licensable, we really don't want you not coming forward because you're not sure what the vehicle should look like. I think it's fair to say we'd love the chance, David, Marty, myself, Jim, all of us, Wayne, would all like the opportunity to discuss what your aspirations are and help find a way to get you there rather than have someone not come forward because they weren't sure what the vehicle was. So with that, we'll, uh, we'll kick it off. Uh, Wayne, I know you, know, you, you talk all the time in the Middle School Innovators Academy with the students about the fact that, that problems are out there and they are available 
to be solved. I, I'd really love to start around that topic a bit. Okay. Um, that I know from, from, from observing what you do that that can be both formal and informal, but that oftentimes is the starting point. Well, it, we do spend um, time with the students discussing how you can uh, just be observant. Um, observant to people around you, observant to environments around you. And as you're being observant, um, just notice if someone's having dif difficulty in completing a task. Um, if they are, make a note of it. Uh, we give them notebooks. We, we ask them to just make, make observations. Keep a notebook. Make observations of just your day as you, as you work through your day. And um, then when they come back with those observations, then we start talking about how do you take that observation and propose a solution for it. So what is the process that you would work through in order to be able to do that? And so what we find is that or what we find is that students are very excited to see that there are opportunities to improve and work on things all around them. And that takes them from a passive role where they're where the world is just kind of interacting with them and they, have, they don't seem to have much choice about it into a proactive role where they see opportunities and they feel empowered to do something about those opportunities. And, and that empowerment brings about engagement. And so those are the, the, is kind of the root of kind of where we start with very young students because what we find is as you grow older, your ability to recognize and, and, and see these kinds of things become less and less and less. Um, and so young people are very energetic about those kinds of things and very creative about those kinds of things. And we started with um, sixth graders. Um, and you would think sixth graders wouldn't be very practical about the things they observe, but they are very practical about the things that they observe. And then when we begin to give them a process to do something about that, that really does help move them forward in their thinking about things. Aaron, I thought about you this week, as a matter of fact, yesterday when I heard of another uh, young football player passing away during a pregame warm-up two days after uh, a head injury. Following on, on Wayne's point, Wayne, you know, in your body of work, which has grown so much since you and I first met, what, what was that, that first observation? Um, certainly part of it is your professional discipline, but what was really that first observation out in the community that set you on this path? Well, in my case, I was working in the field. Um, I work with the school system and uh, we provide uh, on-field services to uh, promote health and safety of uh, athletes at play. And one of my staff members wasn't able to be at practice one day. So I'm the first substitute and so I was there and I needed to do too many things and not enough time. And I didn't have enough time. And I said, there has got to be an easier way. And there it was. And that activity that I was doing was an activity that was um, directly born from my participation in the Engagement and Outreach Academy. And so um, it, was, it was putting me in the community in a place that, you know, I, I had the skills to do, but it was a new setting for me because the community had their own needs. And we were responding to a specific need, but when we got there, I mean, of course, just like anything, you unearth a whole host of other things you didn't anticipate finding. Mm -hmm. And herein was one of those things, so. So you were, you were actively in the community, again, pursuing your, your professional activities, but in effect, this problem found you. Yes. This, this necessity, which was really a question of scale. It was, and, and frankly, my staff cannot wait until this invention is now more widely available because, you know, after I sort of figured out what it was I was gonna do about the problem, mm -hmm. just like Wayne said, we, I found a problem, the problem found me. Mm -hmm. And thinking through possible solutions or is there a solution out there that I don't know exists already mm -hmm. and finding there wasn't one which led me down this sort of path of, okay, what can we develop or how can we modify what is there? Mm -hmm. um, talking that over with my staff, and this of course was a long process, but now that the patent is issued and things are moving a lot more um, along the path of you know, a reality for them, seeing this in their own practice, they can't wait. I mean, this, they, it wasn't just me 
who had recognized this problem, it was that I apparently was the first one who was doing something about it. Something about it. That is getting off the porch. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I think both of you would agree whether, whether these things come actively or passively to us, at, at the end of the day, there's a decision to become personally involved mm -hmm. and, and take action that's really, uh, really the crux of the matter. Um, Wayne, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, in Sharon's case, she, she's in the profession. She, she had some very, you know, relevant concepts of what appropriate next steps would be because this problem came to her fairly well defined. Um, certainly in your case, for folks, they don't always have that problem as well defined. But you mentioned there's a process. Can you, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about, more about that? Well, we use a process with the, the students that um, revolves around creative thinking. And so we begin to look at the components that have been identified within creative thinking. And those components are fluency, flexibility, and originality. And then along with that, elaboration. So whenever we talk about fluency, fluency is the number of ideas you can generate around a problem. Um, and we find there are, uh, some students are very fluent. They can think of a lot of different ways to do stuff. Um, then uh, flexibility is the ability of that particular idea to solve a particular problem. And so whenever we talk about uh, flexibility, um, it's really looking at all the options that you came up with and which ones are seen to be more appropriate to the particular problem. And then originality is how unusual or unique is the solution. Because if you're repeating something that has already been successful as a solution, then you're, you're really not moving that idea very far forward. So we spend a lot of time talking about how unique, unusual, or original is the, the solution that the student is coming up with. And then there's also just the process of elaboration. Um, you don't have to change things really dramatically every time to solve a particular issue. Sometimes just a, a small tweak on something will, will cause it to be able to be something that could be successful. So elaboration is taking something that it already exists and just adding a little bit to it in order to make it function better in its current, in its current state. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, I'd love for, I think Sharon can build on that. I mean, you, you, you point out that in good design, building on what's there is good design. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right, and not reinventing the wheel. Sharon, you pointed out, look, this is a common problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, people were seeing this problem that you attacked every day. Mm -hmm. um, but it took you stepping up and beginning to convince them, and you talked about looking for solutions. Mm -hmm. Take us through that process. What did, what did you find when you looked for other solutions? It sounds like you didn't find a comprehensive solution. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what were you able to build upon, though, to get rapid traction, if you will? Well, so Wayne's point is, is my story, essentially. Um, the problem I encountered was, um, so in Eastern North Carolina, it's very hot in August, as we all know, hot and humid. So one of the state requirements for high schoolers is to weigh in and weigh out before and after football practice. And then returning to the next practice should be, um, the athlete should be within a certain percentage of their initial weight. Okay. Otherwise they shouldn't be returning. Well, that re requires somebody weighing them in, weighing them out, and a math, um, a formula and then following up with the athlete to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, that just doesn't happen. In an ideal world, that happens. It didn't happen. And so I had 100 athletes waiting to weigh in, 100 waiting to weigh out. And here I was, you know, frankly, I had a PhD and I was supervisor of all these, you know, these programs and things were moving along great. And I was standing there with a clipboard and a pencil. And I could get nothing more done than reading the, the numbers on the scale. And I said, there's got to be an easier way. And so there are many scales that exist. I needed one that could use um, some sort of biometric identifier mm -hmm. or some sort of technolo technological advance to record who the, who the human being was and then save that weight. And then by selecting whatever formula or process I needed, you know, it could tell me these are the people who are no longer or who are outside of my window. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't anything all that novel, and yet it was. Mm -hmm. And so working with, so I come back to ECU and 
again, you know, just like Wayne has the um, resources and the, sort of the academy set up for the middle schoolers, I feel like ECU had that for me. And luckily, I knew about the resources. I knew about the Office of Technology Transfer. Mm -hmm. So I got back to the office the next day or the next week or whenever and called and, and said, asked them and they said, sure, we'll come to your office and, and hear your idea. And there we go. And so we went through this process of, well, there's a lot of scales out there. There's a lot of scales that use biometric identification. Why won't they work? Well, they're too expensive or too big or they don't store the weight long enough or they don't store enough weights or they're not waterproof or for some reason they won't work in a locker room, mm -hmm. you know? And so we went about the process of figuring out, okay, what exactly will this look like and, and, and you know, with the help of Wayne's lab, we put some designs together and uh, with the help of um, the Office of Tech Transfer, we were able to secure some student support to help um, pull together a, an initial prototype. And we are now, gosh, probably almost four years later with a working prototype mm -hmm. and a patent. And a patent. Mm -hmm. So you took existing technologies. This was really a systems integration problem. Right. That, again, by right. going through that exercise, if you will, and all the thinking with it, you've mm -hmm. ended up with a patent and that's right. And, and moving down the road. And t just to elaborate on Marty's generous introduction, um, my I was listening to all those descriptions of passion and determination or um, persistence, and I think what she's describing is. None of the ideas I was, I was none of this, this um, particular project was sort of setting off any, well, that's novel, mm -hmm. which is part of getting a patent. That's, mm -hmm. It has to be somewhat original. It has mm -hmm. to have uniqueness. And they kept saying, this is really not probably going to get a patent because it's not unique. It's not original. And I kept saying, but I need this problem solved. Mm -hmm. I, it really will matter. And so I kept sort of rethinking it and, and refiguring it. And how is this different than what's out there? Okay, well, let me think about, can I purchase what's out there? How can I adapt what I do to make it work? And it was very reflexive, mm -hmm. which is also what Wayne is describing. And then finally, I think I, think I finally just knocked on their door enough. And, and I was able to better articulate what it was I needed. Mm -hmm. And with the support from really variety of places in the university, including Wayne's lab, you know, we were really able to pull together something that was very unique. Agree. So. Agree. That's document. Wayne, I know you you push the students, especially the younger kids, exactly along the lines Sharon's talking about. Don't don't be daunted because you've already see what appears to be a solution. Your job right. at that point in time is simply to to build upon that and make it better. What are some of the outcomes for your for your middle schoolers in particular? What are some of the outcomes that they've enjoyed? from pushing through this process? Examples of things they've, they've done or? Well, not only things they've done, but I know they've, you know, they've been recognized. I know we've had patent attorneys that have been interested in, in what they've actually developed. Um, the, the outcomes from, from this have been that, um, again, the students feel empowered by this process because there's a personal connection to a problem that you identify of your own. It's different than giving somebody like, okay, here's this group problem. You guys go figure this out. It's that personal connection with the problem that allows you or makes you persistent. Um, and I think that that's what Sharon is talking about. It's, th it's the, the personal connection that she had with this problem, not only in, in terms of the, the students she was dealing with, but just in terms of what she needed to do through her daily life. Mm -hmm. I mean, what she needed to accomplish. And she was seeing that there are better ways. There are better ways. There are better ways. And then as you begin to identify those better ways, then you can begin to refine that. With the students, we do patent searches. Um, we do uh, state-of-the-art searches. We ask them to interview people who they feel that, that might have this, some information about this. So they actively begin to go research and, and think about what are the structures that are around this problem and how is the thing that I'm considering to be unique or different from that because it, that becomes an, an important piece of it. Um, but it's that persistence and that emotional connection I think that will we'll begin to move you f forward. Um, Sharon talks about being kind of fortunate in all these things sort of falling together, but part of it is Sharon saying, 
I, I know I'm hearing no, but I'm thinking yes. I know I'm hearing no, that there's nothing unique about this, but I know there is. I believe there is, and I'm going to stay with this until I either find something that is doing what I feel it needs to do, or I'm going to, to make that thing come into reality. And um, so it, um, she's talking about a four-year journey. When we talk with young students with, about this and, the, and they go, wow, this is going to take a long time to ha make happen. And then I say, well, fortunately, you're 10. So by the time you get to be 14, you'll be pretty far along the road with this. Um, and um, so, so those are the kinds of things that we see happening uh, with the students that we deal with in the region. Mm -hmm. Well, Sharon, I, g I go back to your point of, uh, of, of being fortunate. Obviously, you never ran into any roadblocks or any failure, <laughs> <laughs> which we know is absolutely not the case. Right. And Wayne, I think what you're highlighting too is that, that uh, or alluding to, is, is helping, helping folks understand the need for failure. And I'd love for you to, to briefly address that it's, it's not only okay to fail, but in actuality throughout this process, there's, there's a need mm -hmm. to fail in some regard. Well, and, and that's absolutely true. Um, when we deal with the younger students, they're kind of programmed that, that failure is the end of the road. Like if, if, you're, if you're not successful in what you're attempting, that's the end of the road. It's over with. Um, but in fact, that's just another starting point. Because if you're going to have to fail several times before you're usually before you're successful, and um, and how do you take that failure and and learn from it and test it and and find conditions from it so that the next time you're closer to the solution that you wanted? I, I think you know, um, and, and I think Sharon is the living example of this kind of thing, um, but. Uh, getting your mind out of the, the set that w w really what I'm doing is testing conditions, not for, for failure, but for success. And so the more quickly you can test those conditions to see if it's going to actually do the thing that you want it to do, the more quickly you can bring about success. And so fail quickly, fail often, and, and you know, and learn from each of those how to build the actual thing that you've got in your head that you want to create. I just, I think from a, uh, an application standpoint, what I initially envisioned um, in terms of a design standpoint, um, because the idea has really been unchanged since the very first day that I met with the uh, Office of Technology Transfer, but the design, what it looks like, how big it is, and has changed quite a bit and a lot of that has to do with changing technology mm -hmm. because even four years ago the word Bluetooth wasn't wireless that wasn't as commonplace as it is now mm -hmm. so the way the components in my device can communicate can happen in a much um, in a much different way because there aren't wires going here or there there doesn't need to be the, the bulk to hide the structure doesn't need to be as large because the technology has changed. So, you know, even though we found something that worked, there's, there's a constant, this, this constant evolution of, I won't even say it's always a failure, it's just a constant review of can this be better? Mm -hmm. You know, can we continue to improve on something? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think, I mean, I, I try to do that with a lot of things. And I think when you're, you know, we were talking uh, earlier about some of the buzz phrases and I'm, I'm a, solution focused person. Mm -hmm. I, I try to accomplish a lot of things and in doing so you have to be able to be efficient and so I'm always looking at ways to be more efficient and sometimes that means you know having to clean up what I'm already doing and other times it means finding new ways to do things and that's sort of how this came about. I would agree. You, you know you're literally in the human performance business. Right. I mean, this invention, and you as an innovator and as a, as a, as a scientific professional, that's, that's your area, human mm -hmm. performance, human safety. Wayne, I would say you, you equally from a different direction in, in the end analysis are about talent development and, and human performance. Would you both be kind enough to share for us? I mean, I, I think you share the same philosophy around failure, the need to break your ideas to make them better. Um, 
Talk to us, though, about the, the normal response of the world around you to that philosophy. Um, you know, when it, I know from experience in, in working with Wayne on the Innovators Academy, the hardest challenge we have is to get the adults who are helping in the academy to get out of a frame of no, get out of a frame of reference to no, and it goes back to Mike's point. You've got to get to yes. If you're not going to get to yes, you're not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's worth folks understanding what the, what, what the response to the systems, the bureaucracy, the world around you is mm -hmm. when you adopt that mindset and what you have to persevere through. Well, I'll, I'll say um, I've, I've heard both. I've heard, I've heard things like from people who will actually be using the product, mm -hmm. um, wow, that's great. You know, when can we get one? You know, uh, gosh, can we, how can we make this happen faster? So I've heard the yes, mm -hmm. but I've also, in trying to seek out, you know, when, when you're thinking about the design, now that we have the, the, the prototype, there's a lot of design features, and that's where Wayne really comes in as well, um, choosing materials and choosing color and, and layouts and these kinds of things. I'm trying to really solicit the opinions of a lot of people who also could be using it, and what are their environments like, and what are their preferences, and a lot of people aren't interested. Oh, we've got that. Mm -hmm. And they really, their mind really isn't quite as open as I wish it could be. Or I'm not explaining myself well. So I've heard the no as well. But, um, you know, I, I don't expect everybody to understand, you know, I, I don't, if everybody has a different gift and a different talent, and, and I understand that some people may not be as interested in it, and they can only see it when it's a final product. But I guess one of the messages I would want to convey and is, Everybody has a problem, and this was my problem, and I found a solution. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, if you break it all the way back down, I think if everybody understands if they have a problem and they look for a, a problem that means something to them, and they look for a solution, they, you know, they'll be able to be successful along this innovation route. That's really your fountain for the resiliency it takes to get through the. Absolutely. The, Absolutely. The if the problem means enough to you, you and you want to find a solution, you, you, you will be everything, mm -hmm. everything diligent. And I, I think the other piece of that is if it, if it is important to you and you have a personal connection to it, you're never going to be completely satisfied with the way it's working. And so you're always going to be constantly looking for ways to improve. Um, we talk to companies that are young startup companies and they'll be seven or eight years into something and they say, well, now the whole world thinks they know what we do, but we need to be doing something more. We need to be doing something better because otherwise this is going to stop right here. And we're not going to have the future that we could have if we are constantly looking for um, other ways to improve or other markets to move into or a new way to think about it or just continually uh, re, um, going, rehashing that process or re-going back through that process. Um, and it prevents you from becoming stagnant whenever you do those kinds of things, um, which is, is really important um, as, as you continue to move forward with it. Um, I, I mean, I've heard Sharon, she talked about, I really, wasn't, I really didn't want to be a business person. And you might could elaborate on that a little bit, but. You know, she said, but in order to get my prototype to a state where somebody else could adopt it, I've got to do this. Right. Well, I, I think, you know, that brings up an interesting point. Some people go out to, they seek to be an inventor because they want the, they want um, where it could take them perhaps financially or they want the life of an entrepreneur. Um, in my, I, that certainly was not why I went down this path. I, in my opinion, and I don't base this on anything more than my own experience, that would close my mind to problems. My mind was wide open when I stumbled upon this problem, mm -hmm. which is, as you, as you mentioned, it found me. So when it found me, um, you know, all the potential solutions, I was just kind of going through every possibility in my brain. And somewhere along that process, even after, even after, the, you know, after the initial idea, but also after the patent's been issued, I'm having to sort of put on this new hat, which I didn't sort of sign up for when I had this initial problem and a, what I thought was a simple solution, to now be a business person because I have a, a prototype. Well, I, I need these things to get into our world, to help other professionals with the same problem. So either we license it out to another company that may or may not understand our market and my problem, 
or I start making them and then maybe it'll catch on. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know that another company, another scale company out there will understand my problem and have the same passion. And what I would hate is that this goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, um, I'm utilizing other departments at the university that are trying to support the entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And the university wants, wants faculty be, to be successful with the inventions that we might have come about. And so there are some, you know, support system. There, there is some, a support system there to help us navigate getting a small business started. And and for me, it's not about trying to create another career. Mm -hmm. It's really just about the product and solving the problem. Absolutely. I mean, it sounds like you feel like you're in an environment that will support that dual role. I am, but it's hard. But it's hard. I I I'm an academician. Mm -hmm. I'm a researcher. I'm an educator. I'm I'm an athletic trainer. I'm all those sort of things I'm very comfortable with. I am not a small business owner and I am not really sure about this whole entrepreneur. There's a lot of things you just don't know that you don't know. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of learning them by mistake as well. Yeah. And I think sometimes um, people feel like, well, unless I can get a patent on this, I, I sh it's not worth doing. And I can tell you that there are people who, I mean, she was talking about patents and those kinds. I can tell you I know people who have patents on things and it has not led to any kind of business. It was, it was, that was not the purpose of it, that was not the function of it. Those are, that, that's not the way that that, uh, that happens. Mm -hmm. um, but it was still very much worth doing. Um, there are people who will have ideas that are not patentable, but they're still very much worth doing. So that's not necessarily the gold, golden ticket. I mean, you may do things in, in, under a copyright or, or a trademark or those kinds of protections, but there are things that are just worth doing because you have a passion for doing them, whether or not they ever lead to a patent or any of those kinds of things. And she talked about businesses. I know a lot of businesses that have no patents. I mean, think about the scullery. What kind of patent does the scullery have? None, but they're a successful business. So those two things are not synonymous with one another at all. But I think you can be an innovative person in your everyday life and in, in, in everything that you do just by taking the approach of being proactive whenever you see things that need solutions. And, um, and those kinds of things are all around you. You just got to kind of learn to get in tune with it to be able to, to take advantage of those opportunities. Right. One of the challenges, and maybe we can uh, end on, on this point, uh, unless we find other topics you all want to investigate further, is time, right? You're multiple years mm -hmm. into this. You've worked for years to build this infrastructure, and there have been folks who have come through that infrastructure and required years of assistance at, at, different, at different times. Um, all throughout this conversation, we've touched on this topic a bit. Um, Certainly, we all understand the general principles of good time management and allocation and so forth. Uh, I'll confess, uh, I think if I look at my life and the things I've accomplished that really mean something, they didn't happen through conscientious time management. Uh, they happened through the gravitational pull mm -hmm. of my passion for a particular problem or topic. And I, you know, maybe I lackadaisically let it take my time. Maybe, you know, maybe there was uh, uh, another force at work. Wait, just share your philosophy on that. I mean, that's, that's a little of mine, but how, you're having to balance these different roles. Mm -hmm. Some of them you're having to adopt that you really had never intended, like entrepreneur. Right. Uh, you've got the uh, conflicting obligations and, and, and really yet complementary mm -hmm. opportunities of faculty member, community engaged scholar, innovator. How do you approach time? It's really tough Did you just now. let it approach you like I do? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it took on a whole new meaning when the patent was issued and we started thinking about um, production and where to go because when we start talking about a small business, that is a non-faculty member responsibility that has to not happen at, mm -hmm. this, on, at this job. And so um, that is, that's a whole other life that um, you just have to figure out. That, that's a real challenge. Um, and, and I do think at some point I, I will have to make a decision because you can't do everything. And so, yeah, time is, time is really, really tough. And 
you do have to prioritize. Uh, in, in, regards to the in, in regards to innovation, in, in regards to my project in particular, and other ideas. I mean, you know, I'm, I kind of joke I'm a regular over at OTT because I'm always like, I've got a great idea. And when people, when I say that, you know, people will eye roll usually because, oh yeah, she's here again. But, but I do think it's a constant, it's just a constant, um, just something you just kind of, it's part of your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's something you're, if it's something that's in, in, important to you, then you'll find the time for it. But the other thing is, uh, you know, I joke when the patent, we finally submitted it, I forgot. I forgot when we sub I forgot because two years went by mm -hmm. and you just don't hear anything. And so in the meantime, you're hopeful you'll eventually get a patent issued. You don't know when that would be. But if it came back and they said, you know, no, you're not going to get a patent, you know, as Wayne said, that wasn't ever the end goal. The end goal was to find a solution to my problem. And so then I would have had to, and, and somewhere in the back of my head, I knew I'd need to pick back up making a prototype and then making just enough or if nothing more than my staff to use. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just one of those things and I, I think you just have to be persistent and you, you just have to be patient and things will unravel as they will. Mm -hmm. Well, without a doubt, you're one of our favorite repeat offenders, <laughs> as we call them. <laughs> Wayne, thoughts on, well, thoughts on time that you've observed? I'll just tell you how it is for me. Um, if I'm doing something I love doing, I don't even know what time it is. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of uh, uh, upsetting to my family. It's upsetting <laughs> to people that I know because if I'm, if I'm working on something that's important to me, and, I mean, people will come and say, you know it's 2 a.m.? <laughs> no. I, I've been here for six hours, and I didn't, I didn't even recognize that time was a, a factor. Um, and so you do have to learn over, over time, I guess, uh, kind of how to manage that, but th that's how I know I'm really doing something that's important to me, mm -hmm. is that I'm not aware of time when those things are happening. And I, I think many people in this room are probably the same way, you know. Um, you lose track of time if you're involved in the things that you're truly involved in, things that you're passionate about. Well, we shared some take-home messages at the beginning. Uh, we boiled those down to, to get off the porch. <laughs> Semper Gumby, would we like to add any, any others? What's your, what's your one big takeaway that you'd want to share with folks mm -hmm. as an encouragement? Um, be solution-focused. Fair enough. Um, do, do the thing that's right for you. If you do the thing that's right, right for you, then those things, uh, those other things will all come into place. They'll all line up. Um, and that's been, been the way I've kind of approached things. Okay, well, we thank you for your time. We'd love to open it up for any questions. Can you describe how you found the people to help you move along with your idea? Uh, kind of. <laughs> um, I was, I was fortunate to know about the resources at ECU, and the people I didn't know, I asked other people. So I'm a great question asker, and so that, that was one thing, but I was also really fortunate because the developer of my uh, prototype, who will also be doing initial manufacturing, is the spouse of one of my close colleagues. So, you know, serendipity had a lot to do with it, um, I was directed to a lot of the ECU resources, such as Wayne's Lab, by other ECU resources. I think the Office of Tech Transfer is a great starting point, and I would, I would suggest starting there, and then that will lead you down the right paths. I'll open this up for um, anyone on the panel. <clears throat> what role, if any, do ECU resources play, for instance, our new, ac relatively new academic program in engineering. Has that played a role, and how so? Well, I think, I think engineering certainly is, is beginning to play a role, uh, but I, there are many others on campus, uh, and we are actively uh, in the process of beginning to, to integrate those, uh, think about what some of the uh, new curriculums could be uh, that would re represent the, uh, the collision and integration of those disciplines. Uh, so we're looking at uh, engineering, we're looking at design, business, medicine, uh, and others on campus and, and asking formally 
where can we link those together? Where, where can we make those collide? What new academic opportunities may there be either at the certificate, undergraduate, or graduate level? Uh, for example, at the graduate level, we've, uh, we've really spent a fair number of years, Marty, Wayne, and I, and uh, Jim, t others touring the country looking at, at different models of how campuses operationalize what we would call integrated innovation, bringing those disciplines to together in a very messy way. Uh, to support innovation. So uh, there's, there's certainly a role there. The institution, in addition to those curriculum options, is thinking about those unique environments uh, where these types of activities uh, can take place. So there are, uh, we're looking at, at growing the innovation design lab. Uh, other groups on campus are cr establishing their own sort of maker spaces, if you will. And of course, within the university strategic plan, uh, we will be seeking a millennial campus designation as well. Uh, as well as the experiential side. I mean, all of us uh, amongst many offices and, and you all as well are thinking about what are some of those experiential opportunities for our students to engage with partners on and off campus and simply get their hands dirty because it's, it's, it's that off the porch activity that uh, really gives us a chance to see opportunities. I can tell from my experience that we've used uh, ECU engineering students. They all have to complete a senior mm -hmm. capstone project and there are um, canvassing the university and the community in the region looking for ideas for capstone projects. So they've mm -hmm. done several of our faculty inventions as a capstone project. They may not have been real pretty when they finished, but it established proof of concept and that's what we needed. Mm -hmm. Wayne, I have a question for you. Okay. How do students get involved in the Innovation Design Lab and do they receive credit? Um, it, it's currently, it's for no credit, um, but uh, they get they get involved by um, com coming with ideas um, and talking with Ted and myself about those kinds of things. Um, and to be honest with you, um, the the folks that we talk to aren't looking for credit. I mean, they're really looking for experiences and opportunities. Um, if they get credit for it, I think that would be an additional nice thing, but um, most of the time it's, it's, it's not about something that's for credit, which I kind of enjoy. If you had to reflect back on your experiences here, can you identify a particular quality or personality trait that any of you have that um, advanced your project? And is there a, a, a different one that maybe hindered your project? Um, I'm resourceful, I think. Um, and I think that's, that's important. Um, and again, I mean, you know, I was just interviewing a graduate student today and I asked her, I said, I'm going to ask you that traditional interview question, describe yourself. What, what adjectives would you use to describe yourself? And I go back I, as early as when I was applying for colleges, I can remember describing myself as solution focused and goal oriented. That's just, I mean, I'm, it's just kind of what I've always sort of, how I've approached things. So I think those are qualities and, and I see that in other, in other faculty. Um, and then I think things that would hinder me, wow, I mean, I, honestly, I, I've been very receptive to the feedback people have given me. and because I felt like I didn't know it all, you know, I didn't have all the answers. Um, so I've had, I've had really what I would describe as a really ideal experience. Um, I don't know, Wayne, what do you see as challenges in people? I haven't had things that tripped me. Well, um, I think sometimes our own, our own knowledge base can get in our way because <laughs> mm -hmm. we, we feel like we know what the solutions are and um, and oftentimes what what I find is pairing somebody up mm. with some some from another field, from another ex life experience, from another direction, can bring a new um, look at things. Um, and so I think usually we trip ourselves up. Mm -hmm. The the other thing that is not looking for you talked about those serendipitous moments, not looking for those opportunities that are not obvious um, and I think that's usually where you find the little gold nugget is is that when you go back and you think about the the people that you talked with through the day 
was there somebody who stood out and what are the opportunities from that chance meeting that could lead you to another chance meeting being you know um, maybe there's no such thing as luck but I think there's preparation and opportunity so you have to be prepared mentally to sew things together in a new way and, and you do that through people and you do that through resources and, and you also just just do that through you know knowing be, being very firm in in where you are and, and the space you're occupying so mm -hmm. I would, Marty I would say my general observation having watched many many people is humility and proactivity. I mean, if, if you've got that in combination, those are generally the folks I see that are not self-focused. Uh, they're the folks that are the most resilient. Uh, they're the folks to, that are maybe the most impatient about reaching a solution that benefits uh, you know, more folks than themselves. But that, those would be the two key traits I've seen that really mark the, the person who's successful in this realm. I've found from my experience that the most difficult people to deal with that no one else wants to deal with are going to be the most successful innovators and inventors on this campus because they won't take no for an answer. <laughs> and I have found that if I had a trait for myself that I see in myself that I see in others who've been here on this campus for a very long time or have been in their field a very long time and that is when you've been here so long when you say inadvertently we tried that once and it didn't work that's the quickest way to turn something off and turn off that fountain of creativity because there is a way to work and uh and it may be times have changed maybe it's a technological change mm -hmm. that and we can go back and revisit and we can come make it work again mm -hmm. so that's what i've witnessed in, in my role in tech transfer here's a question for all of you Everyone has ideas and suggestions about what path to take. Did you ever on any of your paths receive advice that um, you would caution against? Maybe not such a successful result? Oh, I, I, I'm speaking personally, absolutely. I mean, there's, there, every day you can get bad advice. I guess what my suggestion would be, don't get hung up about it, it's gonna happen. Um, but what are you going to do? Rely on all your own decisions? You're going to make just as many mistakes. I mean, it's, <laughs> there's no ideal uh, side of that. I think what you can honestly take away, though, is it's just another learning opportunity. Whether someone hands it to you or you create your own mess, it's just another learning opportunity. It was presented to you for a reason. Press your way through it. Mm -hmm. Extract what you can and move on. Mm -hmm. I think that's great advice. Um, I think moving into this next phase is is the place where I feel most that I'm getting mixed advice. This the the develop the entrepreneurship side. Mm -hmm. um, I, so it's do it this way, do it that way. Um, start small, start big. License it, don't license it. Um, you know the patent doesn't help you. The patent does help you. So I, and this is an area I don't have any foundational experience. So I, I feel like now I'm getting a lot of mixed messages. And the thing that I the way I try to approach it, and, and I don't know which of them is bad and which of them is good because I, again, don't really know what I don't know. Um, what, what I try to do is I try to, I, I try to take time and I try not to make any decisions based on one conversation. And I also try to sleep on things and really let things sort of boil down because uh, then I'm able to sort of um, make a more informed decision instead of um, reacting maybe to the first piece of advice I heard or the first person that I talked to. Would you say you know, that it's quite possible many times all those people are right? It's really a matter of what you choose and in, in the ramifications of that particular right. path and what you're willing to accept. Right, yeah. right. And that's where that reflection comes in. Right. Uh, I, I guess the thing you hear people say all, all the time, well, I've got a lot of experience. And sometimes I want to follow that question up with, but was it good experience? <laughs> because sometimes people have a lot of experience, but the experience wasn't all that great. So you kind of have to ascertain if, if they had good experiences or they just had experiences. And, and I, that's kind of what I think Sharon's talking about is what Ted's talking about. Um, actually, I, I heard that from um, someone who was really, really young. Somebody said, well, I've got a lot of experience at this. And he, looked, he was very serious. He looked at him and said, well, was it good experience? And so I, I took that as a learning moment 
for, for sure. So that's what I would say. Figure out if the person who's talking to you with a lot of experience, mm -hmm. was, it, was it good? Mm -hmm. Was it fun? <laughs> that's an interesting um, comment because in the venture capital world, when you have an idea and you spin off a business and ultimately it's time to um, seek external funding, one of the things they're going to look for is who's going to run this business, who's going to be your CEO and all. And if um, the, the answer, I believe, and, and Ted, you know more than I do because you lived in this world, but I, I believe the answer that gives venture capital and the other investors a greater comfort is that you have done this, you have had experience, and you have failed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because every time you have failed, you have learned valuable experience you've learned something valuable from this. Mm -hmm. You're not going to make that mistake again. Mm -hmm. So we talked about that earlier, about the importance of failure and fail early. And it, the quicker you fail, the quicker you'll succeed. I want to thank everyone for coming here today. And I especially want to thank our guests here, Ted Morris, Sharon Rogers, and uh, Wayne Godwin. Please join me in thanking them.